What is up, you guys? Teller checking in for UFC Vegas 74. We got a matchup of two top 10 flyweight fighters. Uh, if we're being honest, this isn't the most stacked of cards. Neither was the last one. That didn't stop us from smashing an eight unit max play. Uh, you guys know I, I've been ecstatic about that. We cashed that, but uh, that's all in the past now. We're looking forward uh, to UFC Vegas 74. And although it's not the most stacked of cards, like I said, there's definitely some opportunities to capitalize and make some money. So uh, I am keen to a couple spots on this card. Uh, before we jump into the first fight, I want to let you guys know, uh, for those of you guys that are going to be watching The Ultimate Fighter uh, Season 30, uh, hosted, of course, uh, by the coaches Conor McGregor and Michael Chandler, uh, this, this season should really be a good one. Uh, I am going to be doing recaps of every episode here on the channel. Uh, also, to kick things off, I'll do a little bit of a... Uh, a kickoff, uh, a kickoff show, I guess you can call it. But we'll kind of talk about some of the fighters that are going to be participating on the show. There's definitely some recognizable names. There's some up and coming talent that, that I'm excited about. And uh, yeah, so we'll do a video just kind of getting us ready for episode one. And we will be recapping every uh, episode throughout the season. So hopefully you guys will be watching uh, the show with me there. If you could, please click on that like button right now. Before we jump into this first fight, it really helps me out. You guys know how this whole YouTube algorithm thing works. I don't need to go into all that. But if you like this video, it puts my video out there uh, for more people. And I'm trying to grow this thing. So please, you guys, uh, put a lot of time uh, into making these videos and, and uh, you know, breaking down fight footage on, on the tape of these fighters. And it would just mean a lot to me if you could like the video. If you're not already subscribed, please subscribe. And you guys can also catch me on all my social media platforms. I got them scrolling below. All right, guys, let's go jump into this first one. Welcome to the show, this is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA the fortune MMA teller. Fortune the teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. So, kicking the card off, we have two former uh, PFL fighters, uh, Maxime Grishin taking on Felipe Linz. Uh, Felipe Linz uh, looking really good as of recently we know that he's been really grinding over there at american top team uh he made the drop from the heavyweight division down to the light heavyweight division uh, obviously that made a lot more sense when you take a look at his body and his physique uh, he's looked uh, quicker than ever we know that his striking has always been uh, kind of his bread and butter i mean that that's really his strength he, he has some pretty quick hands he has some good boxing uh and he has uh shown to have pretty good takedown defense throughout his career as well maxim grishin uh, a fighter that's a little bit slower on the feet. Uh, he's very methodical. Uh, he's kind of, you know, plotting out there and, and he makes it work. You know, I mean, I'm not going to say that I've been overly impressed with what I've seen from him, but I mean, he's he's gotten uh, some W's in the UFC already. Uh, you know, we take a look at some of the work he's been putting in, um, you know, coming off a, a victory over William Knight. You know, that that's a little bit of a sketchy W. You guys know the deal with William Knight. I mean, that guy's a head case. Before that, loses to Dustin Jacoby. And then had a victory over uh, Gadjimarad and Tigilov. That's another fighter that's a complete head case. So, you know, I, I don't put too much stock into the Ws there. But let alone, I mean, he got the job done in those two fights. A loss before that against Marcin Tybura, a proven UFC heavyweight fighter. Uh, that was in his UFC debut. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, just real quick, Felipe Linz, we talked about the recent success, uh, knockouts over two very flaky fighters, right? I mean, at least an OSP uh, around this time is a flaky fighter. I'm not talking about a primed OSP. Uh, he went in there and knocked him out, uh, got a decision vi victory over Marcin Pracinio. Don't really hold too much stock into that either. Um, you know, th this is a, uh, this is a funny fight. This is a, a strange fight to, to really, um, to, to hammer in on if, if you guys catch my drift there. So we'll get to my pick, but I will let you guys know, I'm not going to say it with an overwhelming amount of confidence. I am going to be siding with Felipe Linz uh, in this match here, uh, and mostly based off uh, the recent success that he's had since dropping down to the light heavyweight division. I feel like that was a very smart move for him. I feel like he's very suited for this division. And, uh, you know, the fact that he's been grinding over there at American Top Team, obviously uh, that does carry some weight. And uh, and also his takedown defense, like I said, it's it's looked decent. And I think that there's a strong possibility that he can keep this fight standing and this this fight could end up being a little bit of a striking matchup and I can edge him out against a guy like Maxime Grishin. Uh, both men with the 78-inch reach. Uh, both men essentially the same height. I mean, nothing really going on there too much. I know Maxime has a, a long frame, but so does Felipe Linz. Felipe Linz, again, with the 78-inch uh, reach there. I mean, he's not... Uh, you know, he's not a small guy, and I think that he'll be able to to land some shots in the feet. I think he'll be a little bit quicker than Maxime Grishin. So I will edge him 
But once again, I didn't say it with a, an overwhelming amount of um, confidence there. And take a look at the betting line here. Felipe Lins is a plus 120. The comeback on Maxime Grishin is a minus 150. If Grishin's going to get the job done, I think he has to make it ugly. I think he has to hang on Linz, drag him into the deep waters, somehow get this fight down to the mat uh, at some points in time throughout the fight. I do think that that is possible. Uh, but, you know, I will say there's more value on a plus 120 line in Felipe Linz. If you must have action on this fight, uh, I would say I would rather have the plus 120 line on Linz. Sliding over to the bantamweight division, uh, we have two men that are looking to finally get their first UFC W. Both fighters coming out coming out of some serious camps, uh, getting coached by some of the best of them, brushing shoulders with some of the best of them. Uh, Luan Lacerda, uh, obviously just coming off a tough loss against Cody Stamen in his UFC debut. Damon Blackshear, uh, now fought in the UFC two times, uh, wasn't able to, to get a W uh, within either of those fights, but did show to be an aggressive and a uh, fighter that's fun to watch. He's an explosive fighter that's decently well-rounded. Um, Luan Lacerda, let, let's jump back to him, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, uh, you know, being coached uh, by Andre uh, Pet Petaneris for a long time now, brushing shoulders with, with Jose Aldo since he was just a young kid. Uh, that definitely carries some weight. Um, his grappling and his jiu-jitsu has shown to be his strong suit, but he's aggressive on the feet, but does need to refine his striking. I think there's a realistic possibility that Blackshear uh, can land some big shots there. Uh, Blackshear has also shown... Uh, to have some some pretty solid grappling skills, but seems to to make some mental errors at times, right? If you, if you watch his fights, a lot of wild scrambling scrambles going on, uh, a lot of uh, explosive movements, but sometimes he ends up uh, putting himself in harm's way. Uh, you see him here uh, get getting coached by some of the best of them. Like I said, he's he's been training over at Jackson Wing for a long time, uh, so uh, you know he 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 should look to to continue to refine on some of those things we talked about some of those holes in his game now we talked about how uh, black shear has some explosive striking and there will be an avenue for him to land some big shots there um lacerda has shown to be tough uh but but the thing i want to talk about here is that black shear has also shown to go heavily into to, uh, his grappling he likes to get the fight down to the mat uh, you take a look at his 12 victories as a pro um you got eight of those uh, coming by way of submission. That that is a a lot of them, right? The the vast majority of of his victories have come by submission. And although I don't think he's a slouch necessarily down on the mat, I think that Lacerda will have the edge if this fight goes down to the mat. I could see Blackshear making a couple mistakes. He might be in uh, in some advantageous positions at times, but I could see Lacerda eventually reversing him or uh, just eventually getting the better of the ground game. And um, you know uh, if Excuse me, Blackshear has never been subbed as a pro. If Lacerda can go out there and do that, that would be a big feather in his cap as he gets his first UFC victory. Uh, you take a look at his 12 victories as a pro, nine of them coming by way uh, of submission. Again, so two fighters that, that are talented down on the map, but I think Lacerda will get the better of, uh, of of that type of fight. Um, I think Blackshear may be better off keeping this fight on the feet and just looking to outstrike Lacerda, but Lacerda is also very aggressive and will be pressing him, so it won't be necessarily easy uh, for a guy like Blackshear just to outpoint him from the outside. This could be a wild fight, and I have a feeling that in those wild exchanges, somehow Lacerda will uh, get, get to an advantageous position down in the mat. Maybe gets a sub, maybe not, but maybe just does enough to control the fight there and get a W. Uh, you know, you also take a look uh, back to Damon Blackshear's uh, UFC debut where he went to a draw with Yusuf Zalal. In that fight, he he won the first two rounds and then really uh, fell off in the third round there, got controlled and uh, you know beaten up in the third round. And, and that fight ended up going to a, a draw there. And then uh, bounced back with the loss against Farid Basharat. But we know the Basharat brothers are talented. Uh, so, you know, I am going to be taking uh, the Brazilian. I, I will side with Lacerda here. Uh, let's pull up a betting line here. Uh, Luan Lacerda is a minus 140 favorite over DeMond Blackshear at, at, as Blackshear is a plus 115. It's a close line. Uh, this is another fight that could definitely go either way. Maybe you're better suited taking the, the dog money at plus 115. Uh, but my gut tells me Lacerda shows up here. I think that he'll be a little bit more comfortable in the octagon as well now, having that first fight under his belt. Uh, Blackshear also being in there twice, you'll feel more comfortable. But, but I, I have a feeling that Lacerda will be very hungry here and, and he will look to be a little bit of a better version of himself in this second fight here. He's 30 years old. And again, training with some of the best of them, really putting in work over there. Over on the women's side of things in the strawweight division, we got Jin Yufrey taking on Elise Reed. Uh, Jin Yufrey, 
uh, you know, still up there in age, nothing's changed, right? Every time we were talking about her, uh, we do notice uh, her, her age. She's now 38 years old. Elise Reed, uh, in the prime of her career at 30 years old, uh, but Elise Reed has had some devastating performances. I mean, we, we have to talk about them, right? I mean, her three losses in the octagon uh, weren't just any ordinary losses, right? I mean, she went out there, got smashed by Sajara Eubanks, made Sajara Eubanks look like Khabib. Uh, you know, the loss that she had against Sam Hughes, uh, finally uh, warranting the nickname of Sam Page Hughes. I mean, the way she went out there and was cracking uh, Elise Reed down on the mat. And then she goes out there and gets submitted by Loma uh, Ligbunmi, uh, the Muay Thai fighter. So, I mean, some really questionable performances. Uh, I mean, the victory over Melissa Martinez was a good one for her. Melissa, Melissa Martinez came in with a lot of hype. Uh, the victory over Corey McKenna, I don't know how she won that fight. Uh, I mean, it was a close fight. Could have really went either way. It was a very close fight, but she had success in that fight. I don't understand how Corey McKenna lost to Elise Reed. Uh, so you kind of understand that that Elise Reed uh, has something going on, I guess you want to say. I mean, her striking is quick. She has some quick hands. Uh, I mean, if you want to give her a compliment, I guess you could say that her striking, I would say, is possibly you know, average or a little bit of above average, right? I mean, she, she's just, uh, that that would be her strength there. And maybe she could have some success against Jin Yu Frey, the Southpaw fighter, uh, who's a little stiff, uh, somewhat powerful, uh, a strong fighter, but she is a little stiff. Um, but she is diverse with her attacks. I mean, she, she could uh, mix things up pretty well in the feet, but she's not the quickest there. Um, you know, this fight is, is another fight that, that I really am not going to give you my pick with a lot of confidence. I've been back and forth with my pick here. Uh, I guess that's a good thing, man, with this card, right? This fight, or excuse me, this card has a lot of fights that that are are evenly matched, I guess you would say. Um, Jin Yu Frey, real quick, let's just talk a little bit about what she's been doing. She just got knocked out against Pollyanna Viana. Uh, she lost to Vanessa Demopoulos. That fight could have went either way. You, you could be say you could be talking about her right now as if she had a win there and was on a three fight winning streak going into the Pollyanna Viana fight. Uh, realistically. Uh, took out Ashley Yoder and Gloria DePaula. Also has a loss against Loma Ligbunmi, but at least went to a decision. Uh, lost to Kay Hansen, was up early in that fight, eventually was submitted. Um, you know, again, both these fighters, uh, not the most reliable, not the most consistent. I do believe Jin Frey was a champion over an in Invicta. Uh, so, you know, kind of has a strong mindset. I believe she was a champion there. And she's definitely a fighter uh, that's very disciplined. You know, at the age of 38, still coming in great shape. Uh, she'll have a two-inch reach advantage, uh, both women the same height. And uh, I am going to be taking Jin Yu Frey here. Uh, I'm going to edge her uh, to take this fight just because Elise Reed's losses are so alarming. And I wouldn't be shocked if Frey goes out there and takes advantage of one of the holes in Elise Reed's game. Uh, but if Elise Reed can keep the fight standing and maybe pepper her up with the striking, maybe make a late push if Jin Yu Frey slows down late in this fight. Um, you know, but I will I will pick Jin Yu Frey. Again, I don't say that with a lot of confidence. Uh, this fight definitely can go either way. Hopefully no one's putting out any eight unit max plays in a fight like this. And uh, but I will side with Frey. The line's essentially a pick 'em as you guys see here. Minus 103 for Frey, minus 125 for Reed. Pick your poison there. I'll go with Frey, the very slight underdog. So this fight between Daniel Santos and Johnny Munoz was supposed to take place on a fight card a few weeks back. I already broke this fight down for you guys recently. Uh, this line has had plenty of time to settle in. Um, I won't go on too much about this fight. As you, or For those of you guys that remember, I did side with Daniel Santos here over Johnny Munoz, uh, mostly based on the fact that Daniel Santos has shown to be a more diverse MMA fighter, Johnny Munoz, uh, relying on a little bit he more heavily on his grappling and his submission skills. He'll have a little bit of a size advantage here, but Daniel Santos can crack uh, another fighter on this card fighting out of uh, Nova uh, Uniao. Uh, we already talked about Lacerda there as well. Uh, Daniel Santos, another fighter that has brushed shoulders with, with some of the, the best Brazilians over there. And uh, he will be at a little bit of a disadvantage in the reach department, a four-inch reach disadvantage. But I think that he'll get on the inside. He's aggressive there. He has some solid grappling and submission skills as well. And uh, maybe he avoids that that uh, that grappling game of Johnny Munoz and can land some big shots. Uh, Daniel Santos coming off a big knockout victory over uh, Castaneda, a fighter that we'll be talking about here in a little bit. Uh, Johnny Munoz, a couple victories in the UFC over very low-level uh, opponents, guys like uh Jeremy Simmons, I believe his name was, Jeffrey or Jeremy Simmons, a couple low-level fighters there, and a couple losses throughout uh, his, uh, his on his resume, excuse me, there. And uh, also worth, worth noting that he was just devastatingly knocked out uh, against Tony Gravely 
uh, not too long ago, about a, a year ago too. So uh, the chin has been tested. Do not be surprised uh, if the diverse attack of Santos, she'll be throwing knees, elbows, uh, you know, kicks, punches, all that at Johnny Munoz's dome. Uh, you know, maybe John, Johnny Munoz gets hurt. Maybe he survives the fight, goes to the decision, but maybe those big shots play a big role when it goes to the judges' scorecards. Give me... Uh, give me Willie Cat there. He's a minus 200 right now. Johnny Munoz, a plus 165 dog. Uh, I mean, I'm not necessarily chomping at the bit at the minus 200 line. Uh, another fight. I guess you could possibly say there's more value in that plus 165 line. Uh, I think Willie Cat gets the job done, though. I'm not saying it with an overwhelming amount of confidence once again. Uh, I guess that would lead me to say there's more value in the Munoz line. Andre Arlovsky taking on Dante Mays. Of course, fight taking place in the heavyweight division. Uh, you know, this is a perfect matchup for Andre Arlovsky coming off a tough loss against Marcos Rogerio de Lima. Uh, you know, if Arlovsky was going to look to step in the cage once again, I, again, I believe a guy like Dontel Mays is the right type of matchup. Uh, Arlovsky's 44 years old. We don't need to see him go out there and get starched uh, in his last fight in the UFC. I think if he's smart here, he goes out here, gets a W and retires from the sport personally. Um, I know that he's had a lot of late success in his career, but uh, I mean, how far is he really going to push it? Um, Again, we talked about the loss against Marcos Rogerio de Lima. Before that, he was on quite quite a win streak, actually, if you, if you remember. Victories over Jake Collier, Jared Vandera, Carlos Felipe, Chase Sherman. Lost to Tom Aspinall within uh, seconds. But before that, a victory over Tanner Bozier and Felipe Lins. Uh, also had a victory over Ben Rothwell uh, before the knockout loss against Jarzino Rosenstruck there. So, I mean, definitely some late success in his career. Uh, you know, worth noting real quick. Uh, it's an old story. I'll throw it out there real quick. One time I was grabbing some paint at the local Home Depot uh, in South Florida. I was I moved into a new place there, and I'm literally waiting in line behind this couple. It's Andre Arlovsky and his and his chick. I don't know if it's his wife or whoever she was, some type of of Russian uh, model who was tall and beautiful. Oh my God, man! And uh, you know, besides that, obviously Arlovsky, seeing him in person, you talk about a gladiator, man. You talk about you know seeing somebody in person just in uh, an everyday scenario, and that's when you really realize what these guys are built like. And this was back when he was, you know, more uh, more in his prime, right? We're talking about an Arlovsky. This was about, this was a while ago, right? Eight years ago, seven, eight years ago. I mean, he was in his, his mid-30s. He's a big dude, man. And imagine, uh, you know, getting in a fight with a guy like that at your Home Depot. You better grab uh, a serious weapon, maybe a chainsaw, if you want to stand a chance there. Uh, you know, and you see him brushing shoulders with Sergey Pavlovich. He's been training with him, obviously, over at American Top Team. Uh, one of the... Uh, best fighters on planet Earth right now. Uh, boy, would I have loved to see Sergey Pavlovich against Francis Ngannou. Probably never see that. Uh, let, let's jump back to this fight here. Kind of ranting. Uh, Dantel Mays is a fighter that is uh, you know, not the most professional uh, of fighters. He definitely doesn't check off a lot of boxes. He doesn't come in in the best shape. Definitely looks like he could uh, be in better conditioning and better shape. Uh, I know that he's been training over at Jackson Wink for some time, but I, I do think that there's some things missing in his game. And uh, throws big power shots. They're a little slow. I could see Arlovsky beating him to the punch all day, but it's only going to take one big shot for Arlovsky to be put flat out. I mean, when he's 44 years old, we've seen him put out flat many of times throughout the years over the last decade. He's also done pretty good with avoiding those shots, and he's he's fought a very safe type of game plan over the over the past so, some years. Uh, which is shows his fighter IQ. It shows how smart of a fighter that he is. I expect him to do a little bit more of the same thing here, being an intelligent fighter, trying to avoid that big shot from Dontel Mays, uh, maybe sneaking in some takedowns late in this fight, showing to have better cardio and conditioning. Uh, he'll be at a four-inch reach disadvantage. Uh, he, he's a smaller guy here. Dontel Mays is a big heavyweight fighter. Uh, but I think that there's a very realistic avenue for Arlovsky to go out here and get a decision victory. Uh, just as it is very realistic, he can be starched and put out. Um, I'm going to side with the uh, future UFC Hall of Famer and Andre Arlovsky. Uh, he's a G. I think this fight uh, is very close, but I, I feel more comfortable taking the more professional fighter here in Arlovsky. Uh, so give me Arlovsky. He's a minus 106 right now on Bovada.lv. This line is essentially a pick em line here. Uh, do you trust taking Dante Mays? Um, you know, banking on him, landing that big shot? Uh, you guys let me know. Uh, comment below. But I will take Arlovsky. And this is another pick that I'm not going to tell you guys. I have an overwhelming confidence. This is a fight that can definitely uh, be, be on one side of the coin or the other side of the coin. If I'm going to keep it real with you guys here. So, John Castaneda loses his initial opponent, Mateus Mondonko, a.k.a. Mandingo. Uh, in steps in the Tajik, uh, Muyan Gafarov. Uh, some of you guys may be familiar with uh, Gafarov. 
uh, from Dana White's Contender Series. If you guys remember, he had a very toughly contested match uh, where he lost to Chad uh, N. Hellinger. Uh, went to a split decision there. Um, you know, he was a, a pretty big favorite going into that fight. And, uh, you know, he did show his warrior spirit, but at the end of the day, made a lot of mistakes in there and, uh, you know, allowed the judges to uh, to go against him there, right? He didn't do enough to really, you know, to, to snatch that fight up. Um, you know, he does show to have a lot of promise. Some of you guys also may be familiar with him. Uh, from watching him perform over at 1FC. He's actually fought over in 1FC a couple times. He's been in some big fights over there. He went to a decision with John Lineker. Uh, I believe that was one of his better showings, even though it wasn't a W uh, for him. But to go out there and perform against a, a level of opponent like a, a Lineker, I think that shows you uh, that he's not necessarily just a, a an overhyped fighter. I think that there's something there. Uh, he's very diverse with his attacks, a lot of spinning attacks. He could grapple. Uh, he's very aggressive. And uh, I want you guys to take note. This is a, a very uh, big point that we need to make. Going into this fight, he's not a guy that was just sitting on the couch. I know a lot of you guys don't like to take short notice uh, fighters, uh, but do understand that he was uh, uh, working uh, with Marab uh, as Marab was preparing for Piotr Jan uh, just a while back. And uh, to my knowledge, he's been staying very active since then. I mean, he's been in the gym. He knew that there was a possibility that he uh, could get an opportunity to fight in the octagon. That's obviously what he wanted to do, right? He went to Dana White's Contender Series, uh, didn't get that opportunity on that date. Uh, but even fighting over in 1FC, it seems his real goal was to, to perform and fight in the UFC. So uh, that, that does carry some weight there. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, John Castaneda is a fighter that's coming off a devastating knockout loss against Willie Cat Daniel Santos. We just talked about that a little bit ago. Um, before that, victories over Miles Johns and Eddie Wineland and aged Eddie Wineland. Not too much stock in either of those victories there. Lost to Nathaniel Wood. I was controlled a little bit in that fight. Uh, so, you know, that that's really all there is to talk about as far as his UFC career goes. He's 31 years old. Uh, John Castaneda, yeah, I mean, he's decent at, at some things. He has good striking, good grappling. He's a decent decently well-rounded fighter. Um, but I need to see more from him. You know, he, he's been coming into a lot of his fights as a, a pretty solid favorite. And I need to see more from him, uh, to be quite honest. I think that uh, Gaffara shows more promise right right now. Uh, excuse me here. Uh, does show more promise uh, throughout the long haul. He's only 27 years old. Uh, and again, fighting out of Tajikistan. Tajikistan recently be, being put on the map uh, by uh, Nurulo Aliyev, if you guys remember him, uh, the Tajik Eagle. Uh, coming off Dana White's Contender Series as well, uh, you know, so they're starting to make a name uh, over there uh, for uh, Tajikistan and, and the world of, of MMA. And uh, you know, Gafarov is another guy that could kind of go shoulder to shoulder with uh, Aliyev there, in my opinion. But needs to show up here and get a big victory. I think that there's a realistic possibility he gets a knockout. I think he could hang with Castaneda in the grappling exchanges. Maybe he gets on top. Um, you know, putting in that work with a guy like Marab. Uh, Diva, Divalashvili, you know that his grappling is going to be very sharp going into this fight. And I'm going to take uh, the fighter taking uh, this fight on short notice in, in Gafarov. How about that? And, um, you know, I don't have a betting line uh, on this fight right now. This was a very newly added fight to the card. And I'm interested to see where this line opens up. I would not be surprised if Castaneda opens up uh, as a slight favorite or if this line's very close. People do respect Castaneda in the game. I don't think that they'll be putting him to the fire too much for that knockout loss, and maybe as much as they should. Uh, and again, seeing that it's a short notice opponent, they'll see that he lost in Dana White's contender series. Maybe they underestimate him here. I'm interested to see that betting line. Just take note, he's 27 years old. There's a lot of room for growth. I think we, we see the best version of him in his debut here. Maybe not the, the best version to date. Let me be clear. We see the best version to date, even though he's taking this fight on short notice. So give me uh, the Tajik fighter here. Uh, but there's some question marks, but we'll see how that fight plays out. Zaleski Dos Santos uh, finally returns back to the octagon. You guys know that's his thing, uh, averaging about uh, 1.2 fights per year. Uh, if that these days, uh, but a fighter that's very talented, uh, taking on Abu Bakar Nurmagomedov, uh, you know, he is also coming off uh, a, a, a solid victory, uh, a tough outed victory where he was able to uh, get the job done against Gachi Omar Gachiov. Before that, a victory over Jared Gooden. And then he had that loss where he made a mental error and was subbed by David Zawada. Uh, Zaleski Dos Santos, on the other hand, uh, just went to war with Beno uh, Benoit uh, St. Denis, that, that fight was a real fun one. That was actually an official play of mine. That was a long time ago. And uh, Dos Santos came through. It was, it was really uh, an all-out war. Uh, Dos Santos, a fighter, you know, has the nickname of, of Capoeira. Obviously, he can throw some wild spinning attacks at you. Uh, he's a fighter that is very well-versed, though. I mean, this guy can sub you down on the mat. Uh, and, you know, Abu Bakar is a fighter that has made mental errors down on the mat before. So I, I do believe 
that Dos Santos is alive to potentially get a submission if this fight goes down to the mat. Now, Nurmagomedov does have some heavy uh, top pressure and whatnot, but uh, he will have to be on his P's and Q's because, again, uh, Zaleski is well-rounded uh, on the feet. Uh, I already mentioned Zaleski is tricky. He's dangerous there. Uh, Abu Bakar, a little bit more disciplined, a little bit more, t uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for there? Uh, discipline, I think, is a pretty good one. You know, he's technical, he's disciplined, nothing really too crazy going on in the feet. Uh, but overall, I think that Zaleski... Uh, Dos Santos will have the edge in the feet. I, I like him a little bit more there. He's just, uh, he's a little bit more proven. He's been in some wars in the feet and he usually is the fighter that is getting the better of his opponent there. Um, but again, you see Abu Bakar, of course, uh, soldiered up with some of the best of them over at AKA uh, Khabib. You see Kane over there to his right. Uh, you know, I don't know how much work Kane's putting in on the match these days, but uh, a straight up legend regardless. Uh, and then of course, uh, Umar uh, Nurmagomedov, uh, a fighter that uh, has a big fight uh, lined up ahead of him, right? He'll be taking on uh, Corey Sanhagen, I believe. I cannot wait for that fight. Um, but, you know, but back to this one here. Um, Zaleski Dos Santos, when he steps into the cage, when he finally makes that walk, he is a very talented fighter. And I just quickly want to gloss over some of his work. He's 36 years old. We talked about the war against Benoit de Saint Denis. Uh, lost a split decision fight to Muslim Salikov, a very closely fought match. Went to war with uh, Alexei Kuchenko, if you guys remember him. Uh, was knocked out against uh, the leech there. Uh, but then before that was really putting in some work, uh, absolutely put an onslaught on, on the uh, striker, Curtis Millinger, dragged him down to the mat, submitted him, uh, knocked out Luigi Vendramini, uh, knocked out Sean Strickland. I believe he hit him with the spinning attack in that fight. Victories over Max Griffin, uh, Lyman Good, uh, you know, Omari Akhmedov. Uh, I mean, he, he's a battle-tested fighter. I just want to make that point very clear. And uh, he's still only 36 years old, and maybe the inactivity has kept him somewhat fresh. Um... You know, and on the other hand, Abu Bakar, I know he's coming off a victory, but, uh, you know, his, his resume, resume is kind of spotted. And we talked about some of those submission losses. Uh, I mean, not that there's a, not that there's a lot of them, only three losses, but uh, there's a couple questionable losses throughout his career. And I haven't been overly impressed with the level of competition. So that's going to kind of side me uh, towards Z Zaleski Dos Santos here. Uh, let's go take a look at the betting line. Uh, Zaleski Dos Santos, a minus 115 uh, compared to Abu Bakar, who's a minus 105. This fight is essentially a pick em fight. Another fight that is very, very evenly matched. Uh, but I feel a little bit more comfortable taking the Brazilian. I think that he'll get the better of those striking exchanges. And he is not a slouch uh, down on the mat. So if Abu Bakar wants to try to take it there, again, he needs to be careful uh, that he's not getting snatched up with the sub. And uh, and then real quick, you know, let, let's pull up the numbers on these fighters real quick, if you guys don't mind. Uh, you know, as far as the striking goes, uh, Zaleski, almost two uh, strikes landed per minute uh, more than Abu Bakar. You know, as Zaleski almost nears that five strikes landed per minute compared to the three of Abu Bakar, uh, absorbing uh, almost one strike more. So you have to be careful there defensively. And then when we go to the grappling side of things, uh, you know, Zaleski, I don't expect Zaleski to be trying to get this fight down to the mat. So don't worry about that 15% takedown accuracy. Notice he has a 62% takedown defensive rate. It's okay. Um, where on the other hand, Abubakar only has a 30% takedown accuracy rate too. It's not really that high, even though we know his grappling is pretty good. His, his wrestling is pretty good. Um, but yeah, I will side with Zaleski Dos Santos here. It's a pick em line again, so pick your poison. I feel more comfortable with the Brazilian uh, Zaleski Dos Santos. What a way to kick off the main card. We got the Georgian Viking Guram Kuta Telazi taking on Jamie Malarkey. Uh, you guys know both these fighters always bring the fight. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what though, this isn't going to be like the last fight uh, for Jamie Malarkey in the sense he's not going to be able to go out there and exploit the ground game of his opponent. We know that Guram is very well-rounded and I'll be very clear to say that the Georgian Viking is uh, a fighter that is just about as under the radar as anybody in the UFC right now. Uh, he potentially should have won his last fight. Uh, against the uh, very dangerous and very promising Demir Ismagulov. Uh, I really think that he could have possibly won that fight. It was very close, but Guram was the fighter who was really bringing the fight. Demir playing it a little bit uh, more uh, intellectual, trying to, to uh, get a nod on the judges' scorecards there. And again, it was really arguable that he even did enough to do that. Uh, before that, Guram had a victory over Mateus Gamrat. 
Um, you know, not a lot of big names on his resume, but when you break the tape down on him, you understand uh, the level of skill that he possesses. Uh, you, we know that he trains with some of the best of them. We know that he trains a lot with uh, Kamzat Shemaev. They're very close, and, and a lot of guys from, from over there uh, in that side of the world. Uh, you know, Jamie Malarkey, on the other hand, he's a fighter that has proven that he can crack, still only 28 years old, so you know he's only going to look better and better. Uh, you know, the Francisco Prado fight, you know, he took on an undersized uh, very green fighter and, and used the ground game there. Before that, he, he talked about bad decisions. He arguably uh, should have lost against Michael Johnson there. And then he was knocked out against Jalen Turner before that. So, uh, you know, a little bit of a tough road as of recently. The big wins for him, obviously the knockouts over Kama Worthy and Devontae Smith. But, um, you know, when you take on a guy like Guram, who's just, he checks off so many boxes. And not only does he check off those boxes, he's very good in all aspects of the game. Absolutely chiseled. I mean, this guy, I cannot wait to see him uh, fighting in some big name fights because he always brings the fights. Excuse me. He always brings the fight and his fights end up being very entertaining. And I think that he matches up very well with all the best in the division. Uh, you know, first thing first though, he's got Jamie Malarkey in front of him. We know Jamie can crack, um, but I think I'm showing my cards here. I am. I am definitely uh, favoring uh, Guram to get the job done here. Even though he's 12-3, and three, that, that resume just doesn't really sum up who he is right now as a fighter. Uh, I think that he's really starting to peak. And other than that, too, let's just take note. Uh, Guram, 31 years old, going right into the prime of his career right now. I think that he really starts to put things together. Half of his victories coming by way of knockout. Uh, out of those 12 victories, six uh, knockouts, four decisions, one submission. Uh, in his three losses, he was submitted once. Uh, and the other two were via decision. Um, so, you know, I mean, I just think that Guram will be more explosive, more powerful. And I think that the volume will be there for him. And I just think that if it goes to the judges' scorecards, he gets the nod. Maybe he lands a big shot. We've seen Jamie Malarkey put out recently. Jalen Turner was able to finish him. Guram does possess some serious power. Um, you take a look at the numbers, Jamie Malarkey, uh, la landing, uh, s slightly more volume in, in his fights, uh, and both men absorbing, uh, relatively the same amount of strikes per minute. Nothing really crazy going on here. Uh, I have a feeling this fight will play it on the play out on the feet. Garam has very good takedown defense. I don't see him trying to get the fight down there. I think that they slug it out. Uh, Garam tends to enjoy a good old fashioned slug fest. So does Jamie Malarkey. I think Garam gets the better uh, of that scenario. And uh, we will slide over to the betting line where we, we will see that uh, Guram, uh, here, excuse me here, uh, he is a minus 310 favorite over Jamie Malarkey. So a little bit of a steep line, but it's understandable. And I have no problem with it. I just think that he goes out there and gets the job done. Uh, he's due for a big victory. He's coming off a disappointing uh, loss where he probably felt he could have got the nod there. So he's hungry. And uh, Jamie Malarkey's tough, but uh, he's going to have his hands full. Hey guys, real quick, a little info infomercial. I hope you guys are following me on IG because I'm pumping out some, some real fun and solid content. Uh, it's kind of cut off here in the picture, but if you can't tell, uh, you're able to build uh, your, your own top three fighters. You got $3, $2, and $1 uh, there. Uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of fun posts like this on IG, so if you want to participate, make sure you're following me. Uh, you got former... UFC fighters like Juan Adams uh, in the mix over there. He's picking Islam Gaethje and Johnson for a $6 build. Uh, but make sure you guys are following me over there. And if you're looking to work with me for my official plays, you guys know I'm coming off that eight unit max play. Do not hesitate to reach out to me because I already told you guys, we have some big bets lined up here in the, in the near future, these, these next couple of weeks, actually starting this weekend, but in the next couple of weeks as well, I'm targeting some future bets. You guys, this is a great time to start working with me. If you're interested, reach out to me. I'll let you guys know my pricing. We got two Brazilian flyweight women throwing down here. Karini Silva taking on Ketlin Souza. Souza looking to make her UFC debut. Uh, the striking-based fighter. Uh, definitely her strong suit when you take a, a look at the work that she's put in. If you break down her tape, I mean, she's pretty comfortable on the feet. Still only 27 years old. Karini Silva coming off the biggest win of her career without a doubt. Uh, where she went out there and got the finish where she submitted Pagliano Botello. Uh, another... Uh, respected or at least at one time respected Brazilian uh, woman fighter. Uh, before that, she had the uh, the battle uh, with Jan where she eventually got the submission in the second round uh, as well. I mean, showing her grit in that fight that there was a, a high pace in that fight. I've liked what I've seen from Kadini Silva. I think that she's a uh, promising fighter. I like her frame for the division. Uh, she will 
Um, she'll be about uh, two inches taller here. I think that she'll have a reach advantage here, but she's a solid uh, framed fighter. She's well-rounded. She has good striking, good pop on her shots, and she's shown to have some good submission skills as well. I think that you got to side with Kadini here uh, based on the fact that Ketlin Souza, you know, she's 13-3. and three. Take a look at her resume, fighting a lot of lower-level opponents and had those scattered three losses against some... Uh, mostly unrecognizable names. Of course, uh, one of them recognizable, Arian Cornelosi, I believe, and she was finished in that fight. Uh, so, I mean, I got a side with Kadini Silva here. She has all the momentum. She's going to be more comfortable in the octagon, and uh, that will be my pick. Um, maybe she pulls off a submission in this fight as well. Maybe we see a high pace. It's hard to really attack finishes in, in women's MMA, but maybe she pulls off a sub and exploits Souza there. Uh, out of Souza's two losses, she was finished uh, two times, never via submission. She was finished on the feet as well, but maybe Kadini cracks her and then subs her. Maybe she just finishes her there. Uh, you know, you, obviously you can't feel too confident, uh, you know, picking a finish in, a, in women's mixed martial arts in general, but maybe there's an avenue there, you know, somewhat of an avenue. Uh, let's go take a look at the betting line. Uh, where you will see Karini Silva is a 2-1 to -one favorite here. She's a minus 200. Ketlin Souza a plus 158. I think that's completely understandable based on, on uh, all the factors here. Um, but just understand, you know, there's definitely question marks going into this fight. Who is Ketlin Souza? We're going to really see what she's about in her UFC debut here. How does she handle the lights? And let's see what her striking's all about uh, and see how her takedown defense is and whatnot. Uh, but give me Karini Silva. And a two to one odds, you know, you want to be a little bit careful. Women's mixed martial arts in general, but I wouldn't be shocked at all if Kadini Silva goes out there and just kind of controls this fight. Now, before we jump into the flyweight matchup between Tim Elliott and Victor Altamirano, uh, it's definitely worth noting that Tim Elliott is going into this fight. Uh, it's somewhat of a uh, a bizarre situation. You would say his emotions have to be extremely high, right? If you haven't heard the news, Tim Elliott basically came out recently and stated that uh, his wife. Gina Mazzani, uh, that scrub of a fighter, uh, was cheating on him, but not only just cheating on him, but actually cheated on him on the night of their wedding uh, with one of his best friends, uh, this rat here, Kevin Kroom. Again, allegedly, you know, this, this is what was said by Tim Elliott, uh, you know, just, you know, to make you understand, you never know, man, when you're cheesing and having a good time chatting it up with, with some uh, potentially, uh, you know, backstabbing rat type of dude. I mean, if he would do that to one of his best friends, imagine the type of guy he is. Uh, it's a shame. He seemed like he was a chill dude, a little bit strange at the same time, but he was, you know, all good vibes. Uh, but to do that to one of your best friends, I mean, if that doesn't show uh, your, your, your uh, character, I don't know what would, I mean, you can't trust a guy like that, uh, you know, further than you could throw him, not even that far, really. Um, you know, uh, Kevin Kroom, you know, I don't want to go on too much about him, but again, I'll just say this much, man. You never do that to one of your boys. You never do that to one of your friends. I don't care how hot the girl is. And, and at the same time, Gina Mazzani is not even uh, an attractive female. So, I mean, you, you can't go out there. You're a UFC fighter and you can't find something else. I mean, that, that says a lot about you there, but to do that to your boy, uh, you know, just absolutely despicable, uh, you know, but you know, I, I've been feeling for Tim Elliott. And again, I'm not going to go into all the details. You guys can look it up. I'm sure you can find all the information on how that played out. It was pretty crazy. Uh, but Tim Elliott always seems like a cool dude, a good dude. He lives uh, for his, his daughter, um, and you know, that's what he's all about right now. That's what he stated. He's all about fighting right now and just taking care of his kid. And he's just on the grind. And I think that that will make to be a very, very, I don't know if focus is the right word. Cause there's obviously some distractions, but when you have that type of fire burning under you, it definitely will lead you uh, to put in some serious time in the gym. And I think that we may see the best version of Tim Elliott that we've ever seen, uh, possibly. Uh, and, and you know, you take a look at Tim Elliott, he's 36 years old. Um, great cardio, you know, great gr grappling conditioning and all that. Coming off a big win against Tegar Ulu and Bekov, he was the dog in that fight. Lost to Matthias Nicola before that, one of the top guys in the division. Victories over Jordan Espinosa and Ryan uh, Benoit before that. You take a look at his losses. They're against legit fighters. Devison Figueredo, uh, Brandon Roy Vall, Askar Askarov. Uh, he had a victory over Mark De La Rosa. Then uh, he had a loss to Ben Wynn. That wasn't the best performance there. He made a mistake and he was submitted, but uh, victory over Luis Smoka and then the loss to Demetrius Johnson, where he actually gave, gave a run, a uh, run, uh, 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 excuse me, how would you say that? He gave a run uh, of Demetrius Johnson's money. I don't know if you'd say it like that. You guys know what I'm saying. He gave Demetrius Johnson a run for his money. Uh, and at the time, nobody was doing that to Demetrius Johnson in the flyweight division. So I think that if you really understand who Tim Elliott is as a fighter, victories over Matt Schnell, Eric Shelton. I mean, he, he's a well-rounded fighter that can go out there and get the job done any given Saturday night. Uh, Victor Altamirano is a fighter that is very unorthodox and wild, just as is Tim Elliott. 
Uh, Victor Altamirano puts a, a, a great pace out there, throws a lot of strikes at you. Uh, I mean, you take a look at the volume he's putting out there. He's landing 6.15 strikes per minute. Uh, that, that is uh, at great volume, but he's also absorbing a lot of shots at 4.65. I think there's an avenue for Tim to uh, counter him a little bit. Tim's defense is looking pretty good as of recently, only absorbing 2.86 strikes per minute. Uh, Tim Elliott, I think he can have a grappling edge here as well. Uh, I like the experience factor that Tim Elliott has, but more importantly, I like the fire that he has lit under him right now. And Victor Altamirano is a little unorthodox with the striking and leaves his chin up there at times, throws a lot of kicks, and he's just kind of kind of uh, strange, but uh, it, he also gets away with it and has success with the striking as well. So, um, you know, he's not a slouch. Um, and real quick, you know, Altamirano, 32 years old, he'll have a four inch reach advantage. Uh, he's an inch taller and, uh, you know, Vic coming off a victory in a closely contested fight against Venetia Salvador, uh, had a victory over uh, Daniel uh, Lacerda. And uh, he had the loss over Carlos Hernandez. I thought he won that fight, but I actually thought he lost the Carlos Candelario fight. So it doesn't really matter. You could swap those up against the Carloses. And his resume is kind of looking like that. Uh, give me Tim Elliott. I don't say it with an overwhelming amount of confidence because he's had some up and down performances. Uh, and Victor Altamirano is young. And uh, again, he's wild and he throws some big shots out there. But I like Tim Elliott. Uh, I edged Tim Elliott to get the job done here. He's a minus 170 favorite. Victor's a plus 140. Uh, maybe there's more value on that plus 140 line. I really wouldn't feel overly confident about that minus 170 line. Maybe if it comes down, you could feel a little bit more comfortable with the experience that Tim has. If, you can, if it can come down to the minus 150 range, 145 range, uh, I'm not sure if we'll see that. Let's go take a look at the line movement real quick. Uh, Tim Elliott uh, currently... Okay, so he opened up as a minus 160 on BetMGM, hit minus 150, and then he uh, bounced back to minus 165. So action coming back in on him, at least on BetMGM. So you monitor that line. Maybe it dips back if you didn't catch that minus 150, if you like that line already. Um, we'll monitor that. But give me Tim Elliott, and I hope he gets the job done for his sake. In the lightweight division, we got the Hall of Famer, or at least future Hall of Famer. He better be uh, Jimbo Miller. Uh, taking on Jared Gordon, uh, also a recognizable name in the game. Jim Miller, now 39 years old in the lightweight division. That is unheard of. Uh, we know Jim Miller has made uh, made a career of being an extremely well-rounded fighter. Great grappling skills, great striping, striking, very durable. I mean, does it all. They've constantly thrown these young and up-and-coming fighters towards his way, and he just always got the job done uh, You know, over the past couple of years. Um, what, what a legend he, he is. What, what a legend Jim Miller truly is. And then Jared Gordon, uh, you know, a tough fighter as well. And Jared Gordon, uh, you know, I guess if you get accidentally headbutted in and knocked out, they don't look at it the same as if you just got flatline knocked out because he just stepped down in the cage. I'm kind of surprised that the uh, athletic commission or whatnot is allowing him to fight, right? Because he just got literally like flatlined against Bobby Green. That fight just took place uh, April 22nd. I mean, that was a month ago. Uh, so you have to wonder what his chin's looking like or how his brain is feeling right now. Before that, you know, he had the victory against Patty Pimlet. We know about the, the robbery there. Listen, Jared Gordon, a very tough fighter. I think his striking is somewhat underrated. His boxing's been looking good as of recently. Uh, we know he could wrestle. Jim Miller, I already went, went on about him. Uh, but you know what? At some point in time, man, the age has to catch up to you. And we've seen that uh, in his last fight, right? Jim Miller coming off a, a tough loss uh, where he uh, took an L against Alexander Hernandez, a very up and down type of fighter. Um, you know, victories over Cerrone, Mota, and Gonzalez before that. If you kind of take a look at the fact that Cerrone was so old, Nicholas Mota and Gonzalez really not doing much. I mean, maybe you understand that a guy like Gordon is probably going to go out here and get the job done barring that chin holds up and that brain is is rested because again if miller lands one shot maybe we see gordon get flatlined i think there is a realistic possibility of that we know that jim always comes in uh ready to go he's primed and he's conditioned and he's all that even for a 39 year old and um I still have to go with Gordon here. I think you have to go with Gordon. You don't really have a choice. Uh, Gordon, good wrestling, good power in his hands, good boxing skills. Uh, I think that he uh, gets the job done here. Um, let's take a look at this betting line. Let's see what we're talking about. Uh, Gordon is a minus 195 favorite. Jim Miller, a plus 158 dog. Uh, I think if it wasn't for the fact that Gordon just got headbutt knocked out, uh, I think that the line would be more like a minus 280, minus 300, quite quite honestly. So that that just playing a big factor, that, that headbutt, playing a factor, people kind of questioning where his brain is at. I still have to side with Jared Gordon. And even that line to me, it seems like that's the better line rather than attacking the aged Jim Miller based off 
uh, the fact that time is just catching up to him. I know that he went to war in his last fight. He always brings the fight, but Gordon is more than willing to oblige you there. He'll meet you and he'll bring the war just as much as you will. In the co-main event, we got a featherweight matchup between Alex Caceres, aka Bruce Leroy, taking on Daniel Pineda. Who the hell is Daniel Pineda, man? This fighter, he, he just has always shown uh, so many different versions of himself when he's in the cage. We remember him in the Bellator cage for years. Uh, definitely a well-rounded, tough dude. Went over to the PFL. He was on performance-enhancing drugs. Put in some crazy work over in the PFL. If you guys forgot about that, uh, you know, going out there uh, and getting, uh, well, they were overturned, overturned, but victories over Jeremy Kennedy and Movlid uh, Kabulov, uh, you know, putting in, putting in plenty of work, uh, you know, outside of the UFC. He comes into the UFC, gets a knockout victory over Herbert Burns. Then he gets knocked out by Cub Swanson, uh, gets absolutely styled on against Andre Feely. I mean, he, he got ran through in that fight. Uh, eventually, uh, that fight was, I believe it was a no contest. Or no, eh, it says not confirmed here. I think it was a victory. Or no, it was. It was a no decision. I, I remember that. It, there was no victor, no victor in the fight. Uh, I believe it was an eye poke or something like that. But either way, just know that Andre Andre Feely was teeing off on him and making him look like a complete slouch out there. And then uh, he goes in there and he submits Tucker Lutz in a fight where he was a dog. So you just you don't know what kind of uh, version of him you're ever getting, man. If you if you ask me, and he's 37 years old and he looked great in his last fight. Uh, is he on the performance enhancing drugs? I mean, most likely not. I would assume. You know, they're testing him. But uh, Alex Caceres is a guy that's definitely not on anything like that. You guys know I've had the pleasure to chat it up with them. I mean, this is a an organic type of dude. And this is a fighter that has aged uh, like fine wine as far as his, his MMA career goes. He's gotten better and better over the years. Uh, had a stellar knockout as of recently over Julian Erosa, where he threw that, that uh, step in punch and then followed it up with the head kick, right, you know, kind of. Uh, blanketed it over uh, and, and put Orosa out there. Uh, we know that he has decent grappling skills. He's a well-rounded fighter. He's rangy. Uh, I like Bruce Leroy, man. He's a he's really a, a cool fighter. And I remember watching him. We talked about it. I remember watching him when I was a kid uh, back when he was on YouTube in those street fights in Miami. He was fighting on those those cards, like the Kimbo fights and all that on YouTube. You guys could probably pull those up. And he was always using his jujitsu back there, back in the day uh, to, to uh, handle those, those street fighters. Uh, he's now 34 years old. Uh, Pineda's 37. Caceres will have a four and a half inch reach advantage. He's three inches taller, uh, about a three inch leg reach as well. He's the, the more rangy fighter for sure. Just needs to be careful. And Pineda uh, carries some power. And when he's hitting on all cylinders, he's a dangerous fighter. I still got to pick the more reliable uh, number 15th ranked featherweight Alex Caceres. Um, I, I, I just think he's been more of a consistent fighter. Uh, again, that, that coming off that victory against Erosa. Uh, before that, a loss to Sadiq Yusuf, but Yusuf is the real deal. Um, you know, victories over Sang Wu Choi, Kevin Kroom, there's that right again, uh, Austin Springer, Chase Hooper, Steven Peterson. Now, not the biggest of names, but still going out there, just looking good, looking sharp. And uh, I, I just, I don't want to bank on a guy, Daniel Pineda, who, who you could pick him and then he just shows up to be, uh, you know, the flip-flop version of himself. You know, it could be either side of things. And at least Alex Caceres is pretty consistent. Uh, you know, maybe other than the, the Cron Gracie fight where he went down to the mat, he should have done that, but it is what it is. Uh, give me Alex Caceres to get the job done. Um, and I'll say he wins a decision. Most likely, uh, Daniel Pineda is shown to be pretty tough. Let's, sh let's take a look at the betting line here. Um, Alex Caceres, a minus 175 favorite Pineda plus 145 dog. You know, I don't know if you could really say you have a lot of confidence when you pick Bruce Leroy based on the fact that again, we don't know what kind of Pineda is showing up and he's coming off a pretty big victory. And, uh, and then also real quick, let's just take a look at something real quick here. Uh, you know, out of uh, Bruce Leroy's 13 losses, uh, five via sub, one via knockout. Uh, on the other hand, Pineda uh, losing out of his 14 losses, five decision, two knockouts, or excuse me, three knockouts, two subs. Uh, you know, again, le leading me more to see a decision victory for, for Caceres. We'll see about that. Um, Caceres will be my pick to get the job done. Hey, you guys, real quick, if you're looking to sign up, to a new sports book, you guys know I always got an offer on the table for you guys. I will give you uh, this upcoming fight cards, a uh, full betting package for free. If you sign up through my referral link, you'll get an added bonus to your Bavada.lv account. Uh, this is the sports book that we're looking at. It's a sports book that I use. Uh, in my opinion, it's the best one out there. Just It's very aesthetically pleasing. Payouts are great. Customer service, all that. If you're interested, uh, shoot me an email or message me on Instagram or Twitter. And uh, we'll get you signed up there, and I will hook you guys up for this weekend. You guys know we're rolling in hot off the eight-unit max play, and I'm targeting some some solid bets for this card.
And then over to the big headliner. I know you guys are very pumped for this fight. Uh, you know, all kidding aside, I mean, it is somewhat of a fun fight, not necessarily uh, a, a main event uh, type of match, but it is for this card. Kai Kara France, the number three ranked flyweight fighter, taking on Amir Albalzi, the number seventh ranked flyweight fighter. This is without a doubt uh, the the coming out party uh, for Amir. If he can get the job done, at least, right? This is uh, the biggest fight of his career, uh, the highest level uh, of competition. You know, he's passed with flying color so far, but if you take a look at the level of competition, not overly impressed with it. Took on Alessandro Costa in his last fight. I think he welcomed him to the UFC there. Uh, Francisco Figueredo, uh, the, the obviously the, the lower end version of his brother, Devison Figueredo. Francisco, explosive or whatnot, but not on the level. Zalgas Imagulov has been having a tough time getting a W. Malcolm Gordon's not on the level. But at the same time, I was very impressed with his UFC debut against Malcolm Gordon, uh, where he pulled off a beautiful uh, triangle choke off his back. And that's a submission that we barely ever see these days. And it's so disappointing. We used to see it back in the day. Uh, people have just really uh, figured out, uh, you know, figured out the proper way to, to, to defend that. And once you kind of figure that out, it's a little bit more of an easier sub to defend. And uh, again, I say, unfortunately, because I love watching that, that sub get locked up. Um, but he was able to pull that off. I think overall his grappling is pretty solid. His striking is pretty solid. He seems to be a very technical fighter, uh, seems to be very strong minded, comes in in great shape. Uh, so although he hasn't fought the best of opponents, I really believe that he's going to uh, do just fine as he starts to face off with these types of guys. Kai Kara France, you guys know the deal. Uh, you know, great striking, very technical, has that that uh, Israel Adesanya type of striking, that Carlos Olberg type of striking. Uh, you know, they, they all kind of have uh, a similar type of striking style, if you ask me. They're very light in their feet, very quick. Uh, maybe not light in their feet, I shouldn't say, but they're very quick with their striking, and they don't put a lot of oomph into their shots. They're just very technical. They touch the right points. They put guys out, and uh, it looks like he just started a clothing line. Um, you know, he's basically buried in his hoodie over there. Um, you know, but, but shout out to him for doing something outside the cage. Not going to throw any shade his way, man. That's pretty cool. Uh, hopefully he's staying focused because, uh, he has a tough test in front of him and I know he just launched his clothing line and, and whatnot. Amir Albalzi is, uh, he has his sights uh, on gold. He's 16 and one Kai Kara France with 10 losses throughout his career. If you take a look at the losses, a lot of them coming early on in his career, recognizable names as you take a look at those losses definitely recognizable names even as of recently uh so 30 years old i still do believe that he's uh evolving into the best version of himself i like the matchup here uh i'm gonna go with Demir Balzi though i, I just uh, i like what i've seen from him down on the mat i like his grit i like his striking as well even though kai car france may be a little bit more technical there i think amir could hang with him uh, he shows to have some good power but i think the grit the grappling the strength of his may play a factor here um, Albal Z will be at a one inch reach disadvantage. Don't really care about that. He's an inch taller, uh, but a very physically strong fighter uh, who shows to have good grappling. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I got to kind of lean uh, his way. Uh, you take a look at the striking, uh, you know, uh, Kai Kara France landing almost five strikes per minute. Definitely has a good amount of volume there, a little bit more than Amir's, uh, but also absorbing more. And he better be careful because Albal Z does possess some power, throws some tight hooks, uh, some he has some tight boxing. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see how the striking exchanges go. That should be fun there. Both these guys lightning fast. Uh, but I just think that Albalzi pushes a little bit harder uh, and it's just a little bit more durable and just has more grit to him and edges this fight. That, that's kind of how I'm going with this fight. Um, and then other than that, you know, we could take a look real quick at Kai Kara France's, lo at Kai Kara France's losses. Uh, out of those 10 losses, two via knockout, three via sub, half of them, so by way of finish, five via decision. Hard to, to mark which way he loses this fight if you feel confident in Al Balzi. Uh, Al Balzi just losing that one decision. And, uh, you know, I'll give you the name on, on the guy that defeated him real quick uh, so we understand who he lost to. And that was against Jose Shorty Torres. If you guys remember Shorty Torres, uh, you know, a fighter that really should be in the UFC fighting in the flyweight division. Um, you know, he's made a name for himself outside the UFC, talking on the mic and whatnot. He's a talented dude, has some wrestling. Uh, so a respectable name there as well. And um, that fight took place uh, back in uh, 2019. So it wasn't that long ago, four years ago. Uh, Al Balzi, just 25 at the time. You know, he's obviously a way better version of himself. I feel more comfortable taking Amir Al Balzi here. And Al Balzi is a minus 120, very slight favorite. The comeback in Kai Kara France at even odds. Essentially another pick em line here. Pick your poison. Something tells me Amir shows up and just has that grit and has that that winning mindset here. Um, I like Kai Kara France as well. The striking's good. And if Kai, Kai can keep this fight standing for the most part and Maybe showcases striking. He's live, of course. 
Um, but give me Amir Abazi. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up UFC Vegas 74. Uh, what else to say? You guys know I'm riding high right now. We got some units to play with, and you guys know I'm liking our future spots moving forward. I really uh, have been eyeing a couple spots here, so I'm feeling good. I hope you guys like this video. I'll leave you guys with some quick closing thoughts, something random. I'll just throw it out to you guys. Um, you know, for those of you guys, you know, that, that feel like you don't really have uh, nothing going for you, always realize that tomorrow is a different day than the day before, so you never know what's lined up ahead of you. Uh, you know, I know when I was younger, I uh, went through some hard times here and there, like everybody has, I'm not over here venting, but you know, everyone goes through their ups and downs, and just be careful, because sometimes you think you really don't got nothing going on or nothing to live for, and you put yourself in harm's way, because you're reckless, and uh, you, you really have no clue, or you had no clue what was lined up uh, ahead of you, because there's always some very sunny and bright days ahead of you. So make sure you're being smart out there. Careful with your attitude when you're out in the streets, man. You never know who you're bumping into. It's not really worth it. Uh, you know, it's not worth it walking around with a chip on your shoulder, looking to fight random people and all that. I'm telling you, uh, crazy stuff happens. I've seen some crazy stuff and I know of some crazy stuff happening around me. Uh, you never know when a street fight you know, ends up to uh, someone's head cracking against the pavement and, and going into a coma and dying. You never know when someone pulls something out on you, stabs you, shoots you. Um, just be careful. I know I was in a situation the other day, man. I was at Home Depot and, uh, you know, dealing with this guy at the store uh, as I was renting some equipment. I mean, the dude was just a complete jackass. But, you know, I just, I, I, bit, I bite my tongue nowadays, you know, and I think it's smart because it's not really worth it. You know, in the old days, I would probably go off on a dude here or there. It's just not worth it. So make sure you understand that today is very different than the future. And the future is always bright. Remember that, especially if you make those types of decisions, the future is always very bright. I promise you guys on that. I promise you guys. I've been there. I promise you guys it's always better moving forward, if, especially if you have the right mindset. If you, I promise you, you keep that mindset, it will 100% be bright down the line. So just stick to that and you're good. All right, guys. Hope you guys all enjoy the upcoming event ufc vegas 74 please hit this like button if you haven't already subscribe to the channel catch me on all my social media take care guys signing out tell her uh -huh. welcome to the show this is the mma fortune teller yeah the mma fortune teller the teller the teller the teller